Okay. Good evening and welcome to Freedom is a Constant Struggle with your host Ki Lun Yasha, engineered by Dina Boyer. I'm very pleased to welcome as our guest this evening Yuri Kochiyama. She's a living legend. Uh, she uh, knows Malcolm X, knew Malcolm X, and Malcolm X's birthday is coming up. It's going to be celebrated on the 19th, and Yuri Kochiyama happens to have the same birthday. And uh, she met and worked with Malcolm in Harlem. She lived in Harlem for 40 years. And uh, Yuri Kochiyama, welcome to Freedom is a Constant Struggle. So good to have you back. Thank you so much, Kayla. You and kind of you invite me. Well, it's a joy to have you and, and an honor. I'm, I feel very privileged to even know you. You're such a, a living legend. No. <laughs> but uh, I do want to ask you um, right off, there was, um, in reading, um, I should alert my viewers that uh, two books have been written. You wrote your memoir, Passing It On. Excellent, I've read it. And uh, Heartbeat of Struggle, The Revolutionary Life of Yuri Kochiyama was written by Diane Fujino. And uh, it's a biography. And when I read uh, Diane's book, um, I learned that there was a Japanese delegation that came to, to visit you and wanted to meet Malcolm. Will you elaborate on that? Oh, yes. Uh, this was in 1964, about June. So when you think of the year 1964, you know that's only about half a year before Malcolm was was assassinated. Right. But anyway, these hibakshas, it was a group of 45, uh, and hibaksha means uh, atom bomb victim. They came not just to America, they went on to Europe and all the way to Moscow to speak out against nuclear proliferation. Right. Um, and, um, and the group had heard the name Malcolm. I don't know exactly how they even thought about Malcolm because, you know, the American press did not have a very good, I mean, they would not show any kind of a good image of Malcolm. And, but the, the Japanese knew that black people uh, admired him and wondered also, however, why America would be afraid of one lone black man. They wanted to know what Malcolm X was like. And so they asked if there was a way of meeting Malcolm and hearing him speak. And that's when he came. Um, we lived in Harlem, and he came to And that me. was we meaning you and your husband and six children, right? Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh -huh. And uh, uh, well, people told us, Malcolm's not going to go to your house. He doesn't know you, and it's dangerous for him right now. Um, what made you think that he might come? Well. I said, well, it's true, I'm not sure. I wrote to him, I did not hear from him, but his office called and said they would do whatever they could that he might come. And he did. And our place was jam-packed. Uh, well, we lived in a, in, the, in a housing project in Harlem, and uh, I didn't... I wasn't sure he was going to come, so I didn't want to advertise it too much and have people come, and then they'll wonder what happened that he didn't come. But a lot of people showed. Our house was jam-packed, and Malcolm did come, and we were all so surprised and just so tickled. One, uh, uh, people were really more amazed that he would take the chance of coming to a, a strange home of people he didn't even know anything about when there was were so many rumors that something might happen to Malcolm. And um, when he, he did come, of course the people were just so excited. 
everybody wanted to uh, uh, shake his hand. They didn't know if he would uh, shake the hands of white people or what. But M Malcolm just surprised everyone. He was so warm to everyone, no matter what color. And people were just astounded that Malcolm has that wonderful way you could help me on some adjectives. <laughs> you know, M Malcolm, his, he's... Uh, he had charisma. Charisma, that's right. the word. Yes. He has he so really much did. charisma. Right. And yet, he's so down to earth. Yeah. Exactly. And he shook hands with everybody, regardless of what color, black or white or Latino, Asian. And people couldn't believe that this is the Malcolm X they've read about in American who was always, newspapers. Uh, who's always portrayed as a hater and right. hateful and all that. Uh, yes. Yeah. Talk about, uh, well, you met, you had already met Malcolm before he came to the house. Right. Um, and you did work with him, uh, I believe. Well, no, I was just one of thousands of, you know, followers. Oh, yeah. I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, one of the things that I wanted you to talk about a little bit about was um, you were mentioning earlier that he wasn't just a black man, he was a black experience. Right. Will oh, you yes. talk about that a little yes. bit? Yes, I would like to quote that. I don't know who wrote it, but I think it's beautiful that it just fits him that Malcolm was not just a black man. He was the black experience. He was based in blackness and yet he repudiated his slave name and just added an X, the unknown, the possibility of what might be, the reality of what he became. And I think that's so beautiful, and I'm sorry I don't know who the author is. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, he did change his name to al Haj Malik El-Shabazz. Yes. Right. And um, um, el Haj, I believe, uh, indicates that you've uh, made the the pilgrimage to Mecca. Right. And he, when he did go to Mecca, was it in 64? Yes. Talk about how that changed him a little bit. Yes. That certainly did change him, but I want to also credit uh, Malcolm's sister, Ella Collins, who, who made a an influence in Malcolm's life because she wanted Malcolm to grow up as a possible leader, a 